Welcome to our first ever Coffee with Gold Star, starring our friend George Takei. Thanks for joining us, George. Good to be here. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the play? Allegiance is uh, a musical, and when I tell people that uh, it's about the uh, internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War as a musical, they are they first guffaw. What? A musical on that subject? But uh, I point out to them the uh, resilience of the uh, Japanese Americans that made it possible for us to survive that includes the strength to be able to find with, uh, in those harsh circumstances beauty and joy and love. And so we thought musical was a, a wonderful way to uh, uh, tell the whole story of the uh, uh, survival from that uh, uh, experience. Now, to give you some background on the internment, Pearl Harbor was bombed, and America was swept by the war hysteria and a, a hysteria against people that looked like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. We're Americans. My mother was born in Sacramento. My father was a San Franciscan. Um, my siblings and I were born in uh, Los Angeles. But we looked like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. And so this hysteria eventuated in uh, our being wholesale removed from uh, the West Coast and put into 10 barbed wire internment camps. Uh, and we were imprisoned for the uh, duration of the war. Okay, we have uh, questions from our members and from uh, people from the internet, probably people from your Twitter followers. Uh, the first question is from D. Gerns, who is curious as to how you balance artistic and political aspects of your life and work. In my personal life. Oh, yeah, your political, how does artistic and political work out in right. your life and work, I guess? Well, uh, I'm an actor. Uh, sometimes we fancy ourselves to be, as being artists. But uh, throughout my life, I've been an activist in uh, the political arena and social justice arena. Uh, because as a teenager, I was curious about the, sh the shining ideals of our democracy that we read about in uh, civics books and history books. And I couldn't quite reconcile that with what I knew to be my childhood imprisonment. So I had many long uh, after-dinner discussions with my father. And it was my father who explained to me what American democracy is. And this from a man who, in the middle of his life, lost everything that he had worked for in his life. Business, home, freedom, and all he had was his family. And yet he was able to tell me that uh, our democracy is a people's democracy. And those people have the potential for, for doing great things, but they are also fallible human beings. And that fallibility was what was operative. And then uh, he, uh, to illustrate for me how democracy really works, how democracy is dependent on people who cherish the ideals of our democracy and actively engage in it. He took me uh, downtown one Sunday afternoon to the Adlai Stevenson for President headquarters and uh, introduced me to political activism. And there I was with other people passionately working for the uh, election of Governor Stevenson of uh, Illinois. And I got a real understanding of what our democracy, how our democracy works. I was inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King, and uh, I was active in the uh, civil rights movement, and later in the uh, peace movement during the Vietnam War. And so I got a deep understanding of how important it is to be act an active uh, person in involved in our political system. And so from my uh, teens and throughout my life, I've been an activist. Uh, I've, I've also got a career as an actor, and uh, sometimes um, being a political activist uh, gets you uh, to be uh, applauded by certain sectors of the political segment and vilified by those that are uh, uh, from the other uh, part of uh, uh, the political uh, uh, spectrum. And so I've um, been willing to risk that 
in order to be active politically. However, and I must make this confession publicly, although I was engaged in the civil rights movement and the, and the uh, uh, peace movement, movement and during the uh, 70s when the a movement began to get uh, an apology and redress for the uh, incarceration of Japanese Americans, uh, I um, uh, got an understanding of uh, how one needs to operate as um, an activist. But the one issue that was closest to me, the fact that I'm gay, I kept silent about. And it became very difficult oftentimes when I saw some injustices being uh, perpetrated on the LGBT community. But I, I wanted my acting career, and I knew that I would have to relinquish that career if I should be out. And so it was a very difficult uh, uh, way of operating, and it was a very uh, constraining form of operating, because as an actor, you know, I am visible, and I always had to have my guard up about people who that could betray me. And, it, and particularly during the uh, 80s, when the AIDS uh, plague was so horrible and we were losing friends, I uh, became visible in the AIDS walk and, and I began participating uh, financially by contributing money. But it wasn't until uh, the California legislature that something extraordinary both houses of the leg legislature passed the uh, marriage equality bill, the people's representative. This was in 2005. And the only other signature that was needed for that to become the uh, law of the state was the signature of our governor, who happened to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was from the uh, right wing of the Republican Party. And true to form, he vetoed that bill. And that got me angry enough to finally realize that I, uh, I've got to make a decision between my career and my political activism. And I chose to be fully who I am. And I came out and blasted Arnold Schwarzenegger's veto and became active in the uh, uh, LGBT uh, equality movement. So uh, it's a difficult thing. Does it feel good? Do you feel better? Oh, it was completely liberating. Good. And... Although I was uh, prepared for my career to wane after my coming out publicly, the opposite happened. Right. My career blossomed. <laughs> and so here I am uh, on Broadway doing Allegiance, a very personal story. First time and on Broadway, right? It's my Broadway debut, debut. at age 78. 78. <laughs> uh, our second question comes from Jimmy, who wants to know, what kind of coffee do you like? Hi, Jimmy. Uh, I drink coffee right before I go to the theater, whether I'm performing or I'm in the audience. But I'm basically a green tea drinker. Green tea has a lot of antioxidants, and um, my grandmother swore by it, and she lived to 104, and I'm greedy about collecting as many birthdays as my grandmother was. So my regular libation is green tea, but when I go to the theater, I like to be alert as a performer and certainly as a, a, a Broadway price paying uh, uh, member of the audience. So uh, I have Starbucks espresso before going to the theater. Uh, our third question is from Jim, uh, who says, do you have any advice for aspiring performers that can't afford to go to a music or theater college program? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you uh, are an aspiring actor, then you know every community has a community theater or uh, a theater group, uh, volunteers, uh, amateurs, and the best learning experience is by acting, and the best critic is a paying audience. It may be your family or relatives, but nevertheless, they're an audience. Uh, so if you uh, don't have the resources with which to go to a uh, acting school or uh, a music a academy, uh, join a theater group in your community. Get in front of an audience. Practice your craft. 
and you'll, you'll learn from the best drama teacher that you can find, an audience. When you deliver a line and you get a laugh, you've done it right. But when you do it uh, another way and you get an even bigger laugh, you're doing it uh, even better than you did the first time. Or, you know, uh, how you use your body, how you uh, sit, how you talk, the uh, accent that you use. Uh, the best way to test it is with an audience. And by trial and error, you will become a better actor. Great. Uh, Rocky Reyes uh, wants to know if Allegiance will be hitting the road uh, going to San Francisco. Anytime? Well, we have a lot of people asking whether we'll come to their hometown. Uh, we first uh, opened in um, San Diego at the Old Globe Theater in 2012, and we broke all records there. We're on Broadway now, and the real test is how we do on Broadway. Uh, we've done the theater arts part, but now our challenge is the show business part, the commercial success of uh, Allegiance. So we're working now to make uh, uh, Allegiance have the Broadway imprimatur. And once you have that, then uh, 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 major theaters in uh, other cities will uh, book us. So we're working on Broadway first right now. Great. Uh, <clears throat> PC wonders, how is Bradder dealing <laughs> with your long Broadway hours? You know... My husband's nickname, I call him Bradder, and that's gotten out. <laughs> now, how is Bradder what? How is he dealing with your long Broadway hours? Oh, well, Brad is in the audience almost every night and matinees. Uh, last night he missed it because there, there was a, a backlog of uh, emails that he had to take care of. But he's amazing. He, has, he sat through every performance in San Diego, and we were there for three months. And uh, here in New York, he's been there through all the preview performances and all the uh, uh, performances since we opened, except for, I think, about three nights he wasn't able to make it. So uh, he is a very dedicated stage door, not Johnny, but stage door hubby. <laughs> Does he uh, hum the songs around the house? Uh, Br Brad doesn't fancy himself a singer, so uh, he will quote lines from it. And when uh, someone's feeling uh, uh, kind of pessimistic about something, he'll uh, steal one of my lines. Flower sometimes surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ariel Abergeo. Abergeo uh, wants Ariel? To, Ariel. Let's go with that. Ariel A. wants to know, what do you think are the advantages of using humor to criticize society? And how about the disadvantages? Well, um, my grandmother used to call, uh, talk about so much of our society as a human comedy. I mean, when you put things in a larger context, it's ridiculous. And she, uh, for example, you know, World War II, which put us in, in uh, these barbed wire prison camps, uh, he, she said that war was fought against Japan, Germany, and Italy. So many decades have passed. They're our strongest allies in the world now. So what was it all about? And so when you see things in that larger context, it becomes, you know, ridiculous and funny. And so what, uh, what you do is uh, put things in that larger context. It may not be as uh, historical or global or uh, vast as that, but... Uh, when you, uh, for example, uh, in, in the political context, uh, um, there was a um, state senator in Kentucky who uh, wanted to uh, ban teachers from using the word gay. I mean, teachers are the people that are supposed to give guidance and understanding and uh, uh, support to uh, young people who are starting to make discoveries about themselves. And for them to be arbitrarily banned from using a very important word in that discussion uh, was outrageous, and you can get raging mad about that, or you can make that person seem ridiculous. And so I said, my name is Takei. I'm gay. And Takei rhymes with gay. 
So if you can't use the word gay, then just substitute my name for that. And you, you can uh, march in a Takei Pride Parade. <laughs> or we have Christmas time coming. And you can now your Takei apparel. <laughs> and it becomes ridiculous. And that bill was defeated. And that senator now, I don't think, is in... Uh, he, he was a state senator. Uh, what, what was his name now? Uh, I can't recall his name. I had it memorized at one, po one point. But he's now out of office. So, you know, you can uh, make a fool of a fool. Are there disadvantages to using humor to criticize? Uh, I use humor discreetly and uh, targeted. Uh, sometimes when it's all encompassing and that humor uh, takes in uh, too many other thoughts or nuances or idea, then you're being unfair. So I believe in uh, using uh, humor to uh, mock uh, stupidity, but to keep it limited to that stupidity, not a broad brush. Uh, we made it about halfway through before Star Trek came up. Patrick wants to know what you think of the new upcoming Star Trek series. The uh, so-called J.J. Abrams uh, Is he uh, reboot. Is, uh, I think they... Oh, the TV series. So you think it's oh, the, TV series. Yeah. Uh, that hasn't started yet. Not at uh, um, uh, The third movie uh, under the wings of J.J. Uh, Abrams is going to uh, be out next year, uh, 2016, which is the 50th anniversary, golden anniversary of Star Trek. Um, such, you know, an incredible phenomenon. Because at the beginning of each episode, we announced that we were boldly going on a five-year mission. And we did battle with very destruct destructive adversaries, Klingon being the, uh, the most uh, uh, powerful of them. But we discovered another adversary even more powerful than the, than the Klingons. They're NBC programming executives. They aborted our mission in only after only three seasons, three years. So... Uh, 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 we've lasted 50 years now, and there's another major feature film coming. And they announced that they're reviving Star Trek as a TV series, but we don't know anything about it yet, no, so uh, I can't comment on that part. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Jeannie asks, what benefits do you think people... Okay, let me try that again. What benefits do you think people receive from putting down their cell phones and seeing a live show? Oh, thank you, Jeannie, for asking that question. Because our society now, I think, has, has become uh, a uh, dehumanized society. I, you know, we were at a restaurant the other night, and we saw a couple seated at a table in a lovely restaurant, and both of them were going like this, or like this. I mean, why do you go to a nice restaurant with either your wife or your husband or your friend, a boyfriend or girlfriend, and spend the time doing this. It's, first of all, bad manners. But secondly, it's depriving yourself of a wonderful opportunity to establish a human relationship. And uh, so I hope that the time will come when uh, we will learn to use our uh, cell phone, I, I, our iPhones, as uh, a convenience to uh, stay in touch, but not something that keep us, uh, keep us from having a human experience. And certainly, I consider theater the temple of human uh, experience. To, to feel, to laugh, to be inspired, to sob, to share. Uh, what we are about is human beings, not this. I saw a lot of young people at the show. Uh, is, is, there, is there something different about young audiences who come to see the play? Most definitely, and we particularly encourage that. We, we have a, 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 another separate program for Allegiance called Inspire Change. The story we're telling happened 75 years ago, but it's amazing how timely this story is today. We were swept up by war hysteria and racial prejudice and put into barbed wire prison camps. This broad brush that all people who look like this are the enemy. Doesn't that sound familiar today? 
when a political candidate for the presidency of the United States makes sweeping statements and characterizes whole groups of people. Immigrants coming from south of the border are all criminal and rapists. Or we have half the governors of the, of the United States shutting out refugees fleeing death and destruction and saying, no, we won't accept them because they're terrorists. With this broad brush characterizing all people. I mean, these people are desperate to just survive, to exist, and to say they're terrorists. It's outrageous. And so uh, this story that happened 75 years ago is very relevant to, to today. And Allegiance tells that story and has that great, important message for us today. Susie from Alabama says, we were surprised and pleased to hear your beautiful singing voice. <laughs> Have you sung since childhood? In the shower. <laughs> and I've kept it in the shower until I was finally persuaded to uh, do a little bit of that on the Broadway stage. And I'm having a great time. I have uh, a duet with uh, Leia Salonga, this world-class voice, this crystalline sound. Uh, one of the uh, critics uh, compared it with Baccarat crystal, and it indeed is as clear as that. And uh, it's a song that uh, I think conveys a simple but important message. It's called Ishikara Ishi, uh, the grandfather singing with his granddaughter, a song that he taught her from childhood, and they've sung it regularly. And it's, it says... Stone by stone, you can move a mountain. And that's what we can do by conscientiousness, stick to working constantly at reaching your goal. Transformation is what uh, Allegiance talks about. Uh, for example, you've, you've seen our, our, uh, our logo, a uh, origami flower uh, made out of the American flag. Well, in the play, there is a very sloppily put together, hateful, insulting loyalty questionnaire that all people in the uh, internment camps, all ten internment camps, had to answer. Everyone, whether you're, well, over the age of 17, 17 or 97, a, ma a male or female, 17-year-old male or 84-year-old grandma, one question asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? First of all, being this question being asked of people who were in prison unjustly for no reason, with no charges, was outrageous. But it was also, uh, uh, had, it had to be answered by an 89 year old immigrant lady, as well as a 17 year old uh, young robust man. It was really a thoughtless question. But even more insidious was the other question. One sentence with two conflicting ideas. It asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? We're Americans. And for the government to assume that we're loyal to the Emperor was outrageous. So if you answered, no, I don't have a loyalty to the Emperor, uh, uh, to, to forswear, you were also saying no to the first part of the very same sentence. Will I swear my loyalty to the United States? If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, then you were confessing to the second part of that question. Will you forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? It was a hateful, ugly questionnaire at being asked of people who were imprisoned unjustly for a year. And this was a year after we were in prison. And yet, with origami, that ugly piece of paper can be turned into a beautiful flower. So that's our logo, transformation. Whether, you're, uh, 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 whether it's an uh, ugly piece of paper that's, that can be origami folded into a beautiful flower, or moving a mountain, stone by stone. Great. Uh, Barb T. wants to know, she says, Broadway has become unaffordable. She grew up in New York City, and she's sad at the ticket prices and wants to know what you think. 
Oh, I started to t uh, talk about the Inspire Change program. We have this separate program which uh, subsidizes uh, uh, high school students to come to the theater. And this is a story that we want the next generation to know because the adult generation today, uh, in large part, don't know this chapter of American history. And if you don't know your history, then you, you can't learn the lesson from it. And so we want young people to know this uh, a part of American history so that they will not allow something like this to happen again. Reaching young people is a, a very important part of our uh, mission. And so uh, we have this Inspire Change program, you can click on it at, on the uh, Allegiance uh, website, that subsidizes student tickets so that they can affordably come to the uh, theater. Also in uh, Times Square, there is a half price ticket booth where uh, those tickets that are not sold two hours before uh, curtain time go on sale for half price. So a $150 ticket will go for $75. Uh, a $75 ticket goes for, uh, what is it, $30. So, you know, um, uh, there are ways to uh, uh, see a Broadway theater um, uh, play uh, with, without having tons of money. Uh, Jim would like to know, how did your TEDx Broadway talk get allegiance to Broadway, or did it help? Yes, I think it helped. Uh, we, well, it helps to uh, get the word out in any way, shape, or form. And the TEDx talks are, first of all, a lot of fun. Uh, the uh, subject of my uh, uh, TEDx talk was to use social media to get the word out. And we decided to use social media to, uh, to build an audience for allegiance by well, what we discovered first was that so many people don't know about the internment. And so how can you sell a story about the internment uh, if people don't know anything about it? So we had to raise the awareness, and social media is a great way to do that. But once that, uh, uh, the level of uh, knowledge about the internment was raised, then we started feeding information about the fact that we were doing a musical about it. And then, once that was well known, then uh, we started uh, ladling out uh, bits and pieces of uh, the music or some scenes and a little taste of what the Broadway show uh, looks like. And uh, people are flocking now to the uh, Long Acre Theater on 48th Street in New York. Uh, our last question is from Patrick. Uh, he loves your Howard Stern visits. Are you going to invite Howard to the show? As a matter of fact, I not only invited Howard, uh, but also Robin, Robin, uh, and uh, Gary Delabate, the uh, the uh, uh, producer of the uh, Howard Stern show. Howard is a dear friend, but you know Howard is mindful of uh, his physical appearance. He's a very tall guy, six foot six, and uh, he's very noticeable, a wild mane of curly hair. And when he sits in a theater, he becomes what we, in the theater, we call obstructed view. <laughs> <laughs> Someone sitting behind him will not be able to see the play. And he's, he's aware of that. So he said, George, I'll help you out by coming to the opening night and doing the red carpet, which he did do. And I'm very grateful to Howard for that. However, he said, I don't want to become uh, an... Um, an obstruction to anyone's view of the stage. So I will sit way in the back, uh, back row, and uh, I will see it discreetly. I will sneak in quietly, and you can sneak me out quietly so I won't disturb the other people. And so Howard will be coming to see Allegiance, but I won't tell you when. And uh, George, uh, thanks very much. Do you have any uh Final thoughts for our streaming audience? Well, thank you for all uh, uh, tuning in and joining us. And uh, tell me in person how you feel about uh, Allegiance after you've seen it. I'm out there signing autographs, except when it's bone-chilling cold or, or a, a cats and dog rainstorm. I'll see you there, right outside the Long Acre Theater. And they can get tickets on Gold Star. 
And you can get tickets on Gold Star. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. All clear? How many people are tuned in?